Ladies and gentlemen, at the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Malaysia, we are committed to provide a safe environment for all parties, both internal and external to work together. IDEAS has a policy of zero tolerance towards sexual exploitations and abuse. Everyone here today is responsible for making this event a safe space for a public discourse. With that, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. A very pleasant morning I wish to all of you. My name is Zakri Idris. On behalf of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Malaysia, we would like to welcome each and every one of you to the IDEAS online discussion titled An Update on the Regional Comprehensive and Economic Partnership as well as the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. For your information, ladies and gentlemen, this is the fourth IDEAS online discussion under the banner of ASEAN Prosperity Initiative. Under the ASEAN Prosperity Initiative, we have conducted three webinars or online discussions before. The first webinar talks on the Myanmar political security as part of the ASEAN political security landscape. The second webinar talks on the ASEAN digital economy as a post-COVID-19 recovery. The third seminar talks on the financial and the capital integration in ASEAN, thanks to our ADB partners who willingly uh, contribute to the discussion. And here we are on the fourth discussion, talking an update on the RCEP and CPTPP. So this project, as well as the discussion today, is fully supported by the Fabric Norman Foundation for Democracy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me to welcome Ms. Trisha Yeo, the CEO of IDES Malaysia, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Zokri. Uh, very good morning. Salam sejahtera kepada semua. Uh, firstly, let me thank and welcome our three esteemed panelists for joining us this morning uh, to provide an overview and update and analysis of these two very, very important regional multilateral agreements uh, that Malaysia has been participating um, in terms of negotiations. And of course, we are so excited to hear um, what is the status and where we're actually going, but uh, more of that later. Um, I think firstly, I, I very warmly welcome Tan Sri Dato Dr. Rebecca, who is our board member at IDEAS, uh, but of course is also executive director at the APEC Secretariat. Uh, Ms. Arividya Arimutu, Senior Director of Strategic Negotiations Division, METI. Um, I think very importantly, she is also the lead negotiator for Malaysia uh, for the CPTPP. So she's the best place actually to be with us here today, as well as our Professor Chandra. Mugen Tangavelu, who is the Vice President of Jeffrey Chia Institute um, on Southeast Asia, Sunway University. Thank you to all three of you. Um, couldn't think of better speakers to talk to us about uh, these very important issues of today. Um, I think this webinar comes at a very appropriate time as well, now that um, the, the new Prime Minister and the new Cabinet has been appointed into position. Um, I think the Malaysian public, a society, business community, expatriate community, uh, our foreign dignitary friends, and the media uh, at large are very interested and keen to understand what it is that uh, the current government's strategic direction will be for Malaysia moving forward. Uh, it's also a very timely event as we know that um, Malaysia has been suffering through the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as all countries around the world have been. So we are not excluded from this. But it, I think in, in light of the economic fallout of the pandemic, uh, we understand that this has been particularly severe uh, for ASEAN, which are composed of countries and relatively open economies that are interlinked with global trade networks. Uh, we know that ASEAN countries are undergoing some of their worst COVID-19 waves. Uh, if in 2020, we were relatively successful and escaped, uh, the harsh hand of COVID-19. I think we've seen 2021, actually Asia Pacific and ASEAN countries becoming the epicenter uh, of the, the third or is it fourth waves now? It's difficult to, to keep count. Um, 
with lockdowns and social restrictions in force, uh, this has really led to a lot of economic fallout. And we expect this to have some significant economic drag on the region uh, with you know, IMF downgrading its 2021 growth projections for the ASEAN five countries um, by around negative 0.6% to 4.3%. So as such, what IDEAS has always done, and we've done uh, several reports, research reports um, on the economic value and the economic benefits that signing and participating in these regional trade agreements could bring upon uh, for the country's economy. Um, and as we see as well, more and more economies around the world are uh, applying for accession into CPTPP. Um, the UK has done that formally. Uh, Taiwan has indicated its interest to, um, to participate as well. So as more and more countries come into CPTPP, I think the question really is uh, where would Malaysia stand with regards to this? And if we do not participate, what does that mean for our economy that is very interconnected and has always been um, very interconnected in global value chains um, and trade more generally? So um, what I'm really interested to know as well, of course, maybe not all the panelists will be able to provide this answer, but um, at Ideas, we want to see how the government's economic policy will also be able to respond uh, more broadly. So it's not just about the ratification of, of agreements. Um, how will the agreements allow Malaysia to be more selective and prioritize certain industries? What is the international signal that we're sending as well to the business community and therefore how will the entire economic ecosystem respond? Uh, what are the policies that we can put in place um, to, to accommodate these international agreements and how we are going to participate in this? Uh, so I, I, I really hope to see this um, emerging more from, from the government, um, you know, sending that, that strong message and that strong signal. So uh, these two mega trade deals will build upon previously signed bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements. And uh, you know, at, at the time when we understand um, the, the theme and philosophically, you know, globalization has also come under scrutiny, um, not least because of the pandemic, but also other trends that were taking place just prior to that. Um, but you know, the question is, will we take that step? Will we still continue to have faith in globalization in economic openness um, what does what does this agreement bring to the table for Malaysia what are the opportunities responsibilities what are the challenges as well I think that's also very important for us to squeeze uh, to, to face squarely and therefore what are the policymakers responses like and what are the mechanisms that we can do and in this regard you know we are not alone many countries have embarked on this journey uh, even before us, Malaysia is no exception to these sorts of multilateral and regional trade agreements. And so taking a leaf from many other countries, I think this is where we can learn important lessons. And finally, how can ASEAN policymakers come together to, to overcome some of these public concerns, um, entrench interests, and so on. So with that, uh, all these small questions, you know, opening questions to, to spark the debate, uh, I very much look forward to the discussion. Uh, I will be around and listening to you and I look forward to seeing what the three panelists say as well as um, the members of the audience and I thank all of you for joining us on this Wednesday morning. Uh, please continue to follow us on ideas as we, we will be um, doing more engagements and discussions over the next six months um, on this CPTPP uh, as we are uh, understanding the, the progress that we will be making. So thank you very much and have a wonderful webinar this morning. Thank you, Tricia, for introducing the panelists as well as setting the scene for the discussions today. Allow me just to brief through on the agenda for today. Each of the panelists will be given about 10 to 15 minutes 
to present his or her case uh, of her presentation on the RCEP as well as CPTPP. Then we will have a, a follow up discussions amongst the speakers and the panelists for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll open the floor for possible Q&A from the audiences. We are assuming that there are many questions, queries, as well as feedback from our business communities, as well as our citizens uh, in regards to the topic. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to call upon Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri Datuk, Dr. Rebecca Fatima Star Maria, the Executive Director of the APEC Secretariat, the former Secretary General of the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, that will talk about on how actually both CPTPP and RCEP can impact ASEAN centrality as well as regional integration. Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri, the floor is yours. Uh, you are muted, Tansri. We can see the skin, Tansri. Unmute. Okay, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's always it's always a challenge. Thank you very much again to Trisha uh, Zol and the team for this very kind invitation. So I'm just going to give you a very big picture. I know the details of RCEP, uh, of CPTPP will be dealt with by Ari, who's who's got a hands, uh, you know, who's got a finger on the pulse of what's going on. So let me just quickly share with you some thoughts on where we are with uh, CPTPP and RCEP specifically as regards to ASEAN centrality. I think that's the question that's often asked. So let me move on. Um, <clears throat> just to tell you what I will do, I will recap what's in both these agreements. I know you've heard it many times, so I'll do a very quick one. Status of implementation, and very importantly, the impact on ASEAN, and the pathways to the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. You know, that's, that's our big goal at the, in APEC, right? Moving on, um, what's in um, CPTPP, you know, it's market access, very important, covers goods, services, and investment. Uh, this is, this is uh, you know, a typical trade agreement. No, no big deal here, right? So 90% of duties eliminated upon entry into force. It's, it's a services negative list. It's supposedly very ambitious. Investment, very, the, the tricky part here is the inclusion of ISDS, right? Everybody's gets nervous when we talk about ISDS. It also is different in that it has rules and disciplines. Yes, there's market access, but there are rules and disciplines when it comes to goods, services, as well as investment. And for investment, I'll just spend a bit of time here. The, the part on rules and disciplines for investment really come down to it when you and the, the more controversial part of this, if you want to use the word controversial, is ISDS. Now for us, we think that ISDS in the, C, in the CPTPP is really progressive. It, it really allows for policy spaces, a good balance between protecting investor as well as providing government's policy space. I was at a seminar recently where Christopher Leong, another director of ideas, provide a very good insight into how ISDS in, in the investment chapter of uh, CPTPP really should, should not be something that you should be wary of, but go down deep, dive deeper and, and see what policy space is there for governments. I think that's, that's important, uh, rather than just being very defensive about it. Um, also important in the CPTPP is the support for SMEs. The emphasis there, the capacity building opportunities, the facilitation programs that's inbuilt into the agreement. So these are things that we need to pay attention to. It's not about, you know, you, you can go into an agreement being very defensive or you can go into an agreement looking for opportunities. And, and that's, that's uh, an important thing to think through. Status of implementation. Well, it's been in force, you know, it's the, how time flies. Huh? It's already in force for eight, eight countries. And the tariff cuts now down to four, year four. So we have to 
think about this, you know, it's year four in Malaysia, we, what's happening, um, you know, for, for Brunei as well, uh, we have to think through this, um, you know, it's six, when you sign, when you ratify, it's, you've got another 60 days, so it's year four plus, you know, so, so think about it, because your commitments, uh, when you enter into, uh, when you finally ratify, is not about year one commitments, but year four commitment. So you've got to think about it. And um, the longer you delay, the more you will stand to, you know, the benefits that flow to you will be reduced. Huh? Uh, so right now you, we see economic benefits already flowing to Vietnam. Uh, we saw this when, when value chains were disrupted in the early parts of this, the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic, right? In the meantime, there's others who are saying, hey, okay, this is happening. You know, maybe initially you're not so sure what you will get out of this, but folks are looking at it from a different lens and looking at opportunities, especially with what's going on in the global environment. And, you know, UK has formally begun the process. You know, the, the thing is when we first started, it was TPP, it was supposedly only confined, the membership was confined to APEC member economies. But when, um, when, the, when US left and the, the 11 pro, uh, proceeded, the accession, uh, uh, what the, the accession uh, article was expanded. So now you get someone who's some, some economy that's not in APEC can, can have access to the CPTPP. So you get folks knocking on the door. Um, other economies that are thinking this through, Thailand, Korea, China, they're all looking at what's happening. And, and you know, so the sooner we get on board, the better for us. Moving on, RCEP. Let me just quickly recap RCEP. Also, RCEP is more your traditional um, FTA. All right, there, there are lots of things uh, to be said about RCEP. Let me just quickly hear. Uh, but, you know, it, it has important elements, the necessary elements to help it move forward, to be a bit more progressive. Uh, uh, truly in, in an ASEAN perspective, you know, ASEAN does step by step, you know, taking it slow, being more cautious, but it does include e-commerce. It does include SME. So there are some possibilities there. Trade facilitation, which is really a big deal. It's important. Now it will probably enter into force next year. It needs six of us, ASEAN, and three, dialogue partners to become active. Now, I think there will be not an issue with the, the three partners. I think that will be almost, we're almost there. China, Japan have said, okay, I'm sure Australia and New Zealand will just come on board with not a big issue. Korea is waiting on the wings, but ASEAN, it's really about ASEAN. ASEAN needs to get its act together in this sense. Huh? It, we need the six, at least six of us to move this agreement. And, and um, I'll, I'll talk about our sense and centrality in a bit. It would be a crying shame if we couldn't get it by the 1st of January next year. But I know that there's a lot of work being done to, to persuade the economies, the ASEAN member states to get on board. Uh, well, the big criticism against RCEP, and this goes on and on and on, is, oh, it's not as ambitious as the CPTPP. It doesn't include disciplines. Um, on managing subsidies on state-owned enterprises, no commitments on labor, environment, and climate. You know, this, this, but come on, you know, um, it is something that we need to think through. In a typical ASEAN way, we prepare the ground. We make sure that uh, our folks are ready to make the kind of commitments. So if it takes a bit of time, it's okay. But the important thing is you have this as part of your work program, as part of something that, that we have said we will be doing come some point in time. And, and it's engaging, 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 engaging with the policymakers, engaging the business community to make sure we get to that level that, you know, of the CPTPP or, or any of the more ambitious FTAs. On ASEAN, so that's the whole question around us, uh, you know, uh, what does this mean, you know, if it's not as ambitious? It, RCEP is still important in the sense of perception. At the end of the day, it's about perception of this region wanting to remain competitive. There is 
commitment to governance, to transparency. And that's what a trade agreement is about, right? Uh, being transparent, being predictable. These are all key elements for competitiveness, national competitiveness. So it follows, you need more disciplines, but yes, you can build that in. Uh, important on the perception of rule of law. We're all in this together. We are very concerned that, you know, our we will abide by the, the rules that we've committed to. Impact on ASEAN solidarity. Now here comes the question. Impact on ASEAN solidarity and ASEAN centrality. Where is this? I'll touch on this in a little bit. And the impact on global and regional supply chains. I think these are things that we need to think through when we are looking at both the CPTPP and RCEP. Um, I like this, this very much, if you're looking at it as intertwined. This is exactly what it is all about. When you talk about ASEAN solidarity, ASEAN, ASEAN centrality. I see members of ASEAN who are in the CPTPP as providing that rising tide. Because our value chains, our supply chains are so intertwined, if one economy or one member state does well, they sort of bring everybody up. You know, So it's a rising tide because of our supply chains are so interlinked. You know, say whatever. So we, we, it is not about saying, oh, uh, Singapore and Vietnam are going their way and therefore it, this impacts ASEAN centrality, ASEAN solidarity. On the other hand, because we are so intertwined, regional economic integration, we've been at it for so many years, we will bring the benefits. Now, the important thing is, can you imagine, when two out of 10 are, all, are doing well and bringing up the rest of us, what if the rest of us also, like the, you know, the, the, the 10 of us together, I mean, that's, I'm very idealistic. I'm, you know, I believe in, in, in regional economic integration for, for, the, for the region, for the good of all, of all of us. So, you know, so this idea of intertwine and being stronger together, is something we need to think through as we think about as we think about the CPTPP and RCEP, our participation in that. Um, yes, RCEP is not as as uh, as ambitious as the CPTPP, but you we must understand where we're coming from as ASEAN. We have LDC members, so it has embedded flexibilities for the LDC members. It does, it does include service and services and investment. It does have provisions for state, investor state uh, dispute settlement for review. You know, there is a work program in place, a built-in agenda, as they say. It has some work on standards, on the legal side, on e-commerce, on SMEs. It does include government procurement, but on transparency at this stage huh? and not market access. That's fine because Transparency is what is so important. In the context of Malaysia and our own government procurement policy, what we need is transparency more than anything else. Market access will flow when there's transparency, when there's predictability. I think that's, that's often what holds us back is the lack of transparency in our policies. Sometimes it's so opaque, you know, if, even the folks running the system, not very clear. All right, so that's, that's what it is. So it may not be as ambitious, but it has important elements. Um, so at the end of the day, it's about business. Does it matter? Yes, it matters for business because you have, it's, it's really about the regional significance of this agreement. Uh, RCEP is, is talked about, is, people talk it up as, a, you know, it's a huge, a mega, mega FTA. And really, at the end of the day, if we put our minds to it, if we put the necessary resources, there is much that we can get out of this. Um, it consolidates the plus one agreements. You know, you can go either way and say, oh yeah, but it's not as, it's not as good as this agreement or that agreement. But at the end of the day, what matters is what's in there. We can always find weaknesses in any agreement, but it is important to look at the opportunities that the agreements um, provide. You know, what are the necessary elements covered? IPR, sanitary, phytosanitary measures, trade facilitation, at the end of the day, transparency, trade facilitation. There was an effort when we got together to, to think through RCEP, it was about dealing with the spaghetti bowl of rules of origin in, us, in ASEAN. 
You know, so here, the, here is an attempt to do it. And I think they've been fairly successful in that. Um, market access, of course, um, duty-free tariff lines. You know, one, one thing that um, we found really a challenge in the early days of this agreement, we, we didn't realize how complex it would be to engage in this particular agreement the parties who had no FTAs among themselves. So that was extremely complex. And then you throw into the mix um, India, which was not quite ready. Uh, and if you look at the ASEAN plus one agreements and you put them on a, on a spectrum, you get uh, on one end, you pro probably China maybe, on the other, or Australia, New Zealand, on the other end you have India. So, so you know, to bridge that gap, even among the ASEAN plus one agreements was a challenge. But the complexity <laughs> that we didn't anticipate was the, the, the fact that some of these parties didn't have FTAs among themselves. So to ASEAN's credit, ASEAN brought these parties together. Where the CKJ couldn't do it, ASEAN did it, you know? So I think that's what, I mean, you give credit where credit is due. So if you talk of ASEAN centrality and credibility, our set is it. So now they have to take this further. They have to ratify. You've done the most difficult part. You've got to start rat work on ratifying. If you don't, there goes your credibility. There goes ASEAN centrality. Okay? I always emphasize that ASEAN is a model for inclusive trade agreements. When you think of how we've brought in LDCs into this very huge trade agreement. And of course, if we do this, you, know, you prepare the way for you to engage with other groupings, EU for one. You know, so there's, there's a lot here. So, and if you're looking at finally the big goal, the big ambition for all of us is the free trade agreement of the Asia Pacific. So you're bringing all these parties together, all the, and hopefully, you know, managing that spaghetti bowl of agreements, of rules of origin, things like that. So this, this is a, a thought I want to leave with you, that it is important that, yes, ASEAN was successful in bringing the parties together, but a lot rides on us ratifying it and seeing that it gets implemented. After n number of years of negotiations, we've hit the final part. Now just to get across and ratifying it and getting it implemented, that's where uh, your credibility and ASEAN centrality uh, will be called into question. Thank you very much, Zul, that's it. I'm happy to take thank questions you. later. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pansri. Uh, even with your presentations alone, Brad, we're receiving a few questions already. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. All right. Thank you, Pansri. Now, moving on to the second speaker, we have Professor Chandra Mugan Tangavalu. Professor Chandra will be discussing on how RCEP and CPTPP can impact ASEAN's post pandemic recovery recovery and expedite the region's development, including through the human capital development, digitalization, as well as productive growth. Uh, Professor Chandra, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, IDS, uh, for inviting me. <clears throat> and uh, nice to see Tanshri uh, again. Uh, I'm happy to present on this, but uh, I will present this uh, in a very uh, different perspective uh, and uh, try to put uh, uh, RCEP and CPTPP uh, in terms of how uh, the recovery, uh, not the post pandemic recovery, but in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the pandemic recovery itself, where the both uh, free trade agreements can play an important role. Um, I will uh, take a different uh, approach uh, and look at free trade agreements uh, as a framework uh, that allows for structural transformation, uh, allows for uh, domestic and uh, uh, global market integrations, and uh, focus on um, inclusive and sustainable growth. Very important and very fundamental for our uh, pandemic recovery itself. Uh, quickly, uh, Tantri already mentioned uh, RCEP, uh, RCEP, it's uh, large, uh, it's in fact the largest trading bloc now, um, consists of uh, ASEAN, uh, the 10 ASEAN countries plus uh, the five countries. If India is included, uh, we might be even bigger, uh, but uh, in some sense, uh, uh, there are provisions for India to join uh, later and uh, within RCEP. Um, 
Uh, it controls fairly 30% uh, of the world population uh, and uh, accounts for nearly 30% of the GDP. And uh, again, uh, around 28% uh, uh, of the global trade. Uh, it's going to release a huge, huge amount of resources uh, into, the, into the region itself. And uh, keep in mind, RCEP uh, is a regional trading bloc. Uh, it's CPTPP is a trade uh, uh, agreement, uh, purely bringing different set of countries in the world together. Uh, we've, uh, initially as a TPP with US as a center, uh, and now uh, we are looking at uh, uh, without uh, uh, US as uh, CPTPP. But uh, ASAP, uh, as Tanshree explained, uh, is a different animal, a different uh, dimension, because it's a regional integration itself. Uh, I will discuss a little bit on that. Um, ASAP is very important for us now, uh, and I'm quite happy uh, CPTPP is taking up our shape with uh, UK already been invited to join. And with, uh, uh, I think there is a discussion about Thailand joining and uh, China has expressed some interest to join uh, CPTPP, uh, but uh, China is going to take a longer time to do that. Uh, there are interests to join CPTPP. And uh, as Tansri explained, at the current global and uh, 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 Trisha also uh, highlighted the issue of global uncertainty uh, with uh, anti-globalization views and also inward looking policies arising from the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery uh, trade and globalization uh, is very critical. Uh, at this stage, uh, RCEP seems to be much more stronger uh, in driving this, and I'll explain why. Uh, there are the unitary key elements uh, in, uh, in trade, uh, rule base, uh, market access, and economic cooperation. All these three elements are very deep uh, in, in RCEP, and the key is, uh, is market-driven. Uh, uh, it's uh, very much market driven uh, and which basically means the role of businesses and the role of SMEs are very critical uh, center stage in RCEP itself. And uh, since the ASEAN structure has been adopted by RCEP, uh, the role of businesses, uh, the role of uh, uh, business councils are also deep in RCEP itself in terms of uh, directly reaching out to uh, the RCEP framework. The ASEAN framework also has a similar framework like uh, ASEAN Secretariat. They have, they have an ASEAN Secretariat that's going to organize and, uh, and uh, uh, create a framework, uh, not just for institutions to participate, but I think strongly the businesses to participate uh, in ASEAN itself. And uh, ASEAN Secretariat framework uh, is not in CPTP, uh, just to make sure that uh, we understand the, the, the differences. Both CPTPP and RCEP are living agreements. So what does living agreement means? Uh, it includes a lot of clauses within the chapters that allow us to address the current issues, uh, which means like uh, Tansri explained, uh, issues like uh, ISDS, uh, environmental issues, and even the economic cooperation in terms of pandemic could be addressed. Uh, that is what the living agreement is. So, uh, and the ASEAN uh, RCEP Secretariat uh, will, I hope it makes it even more, uh, 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 more inclusive and more sustainable as possible. And uh, as I mentioned, ASEP is the largest trading bloc. Uh, it's nice to see, uh, not just talk in terms of trade and, and free trade agreement and speculative bold effects. Uh, it brings 15 countries together and it's the largest trading bloc. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it connects all the way uh, yeah, across the region itself. And uh, if I go deeper into this, uh, it is uh, integrate the region itself. Uh, in regional integration, the borders matters. In trade uh, uh, integration, trade facilitation matters. So the impact of RCEP is going to be very, very significant for us, very significant for us. Uh, with ASEAN connectivity, even with the BRI, uh, we're going to see a lot of impact that's not going to happen at this point in time, uh, like uh, Tansri explained in terms of trade facilitation and how we're going to reform the behind border issues are very fundamental for us. So uh, later I will quickly will talk about COVID. Uh, COVID has two elements, uh, movement of goods and movement of people. 
So fairly CPTPP will handle the movement of people. That's why I'm very happy UK decided to join. And I hope uh, uh, Thailand decided to join so that uh, CPTPP becomes bigger. But RCEP will address both the movement of people and the movement of goods. Uh, because as you can see the blue lines, the blue lines are the logistic connectivity that's been identified by uh, ASEAN connectivity agenda. It's already intact. Uh, and uh, even when you look at Philippines, the thousand islands they have, they call this row in, row out uh, principle where big ships are row in and row out. And the interesting part about that is uh, we will connect to uh, East Malaysia and East Malaysia will be connected all the way to Kalimantan where the new uh, Indonesian capital will be. And, uh, and then uh, Java will be connected. And then we're going to go all the way from Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, even Laos, the landlocked country will all be connected all the way up to China and uh, to India. And then we will hit the BRI. So how are we going to transfer, uh, how are we going to structurally transform ourselves will be very, very fundamental for us. So it's not just writing the free trade agreement, but behind border issues, particularly trade facilitation will be very, very important. So uh, initial impact of free trade agreements are positive across all the 15 countries. And currently we are undertaking some studies on the ASEAN LDCs, but uh, the impact will even be more greater if you have the trade facilitation dimension included. So the complementary effects of free trade and trade facilitation is going to be very, very fundamental for us. That allows movement of goods and movement of people and also investment itself. So free trade agreements, uh, has, as uh, Tansri explained, has one important dimension. It creates a clear uh, framework, uh, dichotomy between uh, this market and institutions. And that transparency is very, very important. That's why uh, I hope most countries will adopt uh, this framework, uh, ASAP framework or CPTPP framework that allows us to see the clear transparency between the markets and the institutions itself. The second iteration is of course, taking this and put into some kind of structural transformation to move ourselves to the next stage of global value chain activities. And I will try to explain that a little bit. Okay, let me explain. I think Tanshri already explained this. Uh, we have uh, uh, ASEAN uh, and uh, AFTA and then we have AEC. Then uh, I will uh, separately put CJK because CJK is very important for us. And, uh, and the greatest impact of ASEAN will be on CJK because that's the first time we have a free trade agreement between uh, China, Japan, and Korea and uh, a free trade arrangement investment movement of goods. And that is going to accelerate the uh, GVC activities in the region and countries that are linked to the CJK itself. And then we have Australia, New Zealand, uh, very much higher up in the services element. Uh, then uh, we have both the services and the uh, uh, CJK together with uh, ASEAN centrality pushing RCEP uh, further up uh, into the global framework. And uh, keep in mind, RCEP also has a very strong services chapter uh, financial services, telecommunication services, e-commerce uh, e and digital services are heavily emphasized in ASEP. So uh, that itself uh, is very fundamental for ASEP. And that in, uh, with India included here, uh, it will be interesting, but as I mentioned, uh, ASEP is a regional integration. So the border issues are very, very important for ASEP. And uh, uh, with that, uh, we have uh, TPP and of course, uh, 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 US left out, and then we have CPTPP. Fairly now UK will join, and of course uh, CPTPP will be dominated, I think, by Japan and Australia. So uh, I hope more ASEAN countries will participate stronger in this. In Malaysia, is one country that can strongly participate in this. Uh, Malaysia is uh, very nicely placed, uh, but of course uh, Vietnam is also getting very stronger using TP, uh, CPTPP for structural transformation. And then we have, uh, country already explained, uh, we have the center, center is the APEC. And APEC is very important, but keep in mind the asterisks, asterisks are all observers. Uh, they are not part of APEC yet, uh, India. Uh, if you have joined RCEP, uh, India might be very, very strong player in the multilateral uh, uh, arrangement. I know uh, Cambodia and Laos has very strong interests uh, to formally join as members uh, as uh, APEC. But uh, APEC will lead us to uh, FTAP. Huh? 
So, uh, and of course, uh, RSAP is better uh, because regional integration. And uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, CPTPP uh, includes uh, Latin American countries and, uh, and includes uh, trade integration. So uh, they focus very much on how trade and market access and investment should take place. But our asset have emphasized more on rules of origin and how GVC is going to drive. So if you understand these characteristics, then we can actually think of how to use them for structural transformation and to create more inclusive and sustainable growth for Malaysia itself and the region. So uh, it is a unifying force, um, much more better than uh, ASEAN plus one. Huh? Keep in mind, ASEAN is 10 plus one countries, but ASEAN includes unify all the uh, China, uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. So it's much more unifying and uh, more market access and uh, more tariff uh, lines are open in ASEAN itself. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, let me talk about uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, uh, the most important part about uh, uh, our recovery process. Uh, we need to adopt open regionalism. Uh, Inward-looking policies are not going to help much. Uh, that is the strength of ASEAN centrality uh, to address these kind of uh, issues and a great platform to discuss. So uh, ASEP have to take that form so I hope uh, the agreement for trade facilitation comes through and that allows us to implement the regional uh, cooperation much more fast than the ASEP. As I mentioned, because of the borders, ASEP has that element to address the borders. So regional cooperation uh, under ASEP will be much more stronger for our recovery compared to CPTPP. So ASEP has the element and of course ASEAN centrality is going to be very key as uh, Tanshri highlighted the stronger we come forward in RCEP and push this agenda, uh, our recovery will be a much more stronger, more sustainable. And also uh, we can use the fourth pillar in ASEAN to suggest ASEAN uh, 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 inclusive uh, growth uh, is very important for us. And uh, RCEP has a regional cooperation element, which means that uh, CJK plus Australia and New Zealand will come and provide the, uh, the key elements for structural transformation itself, whether digital economy or SMEs, or even looking at uh, how we're gonna manage the pandemic recovery in terms of uh, vaccination and testing itself. Huh? So we need that platform now, and that is a very critical platform, how we're gonna manage the movement of people issue. So the four key elements are there and key elements are very important for pandemic recovery for inclusive and sustainable growth. And uh, ASEP is very important uh, because um, I believe the US-China trade war still will persist, uh, which means that uh, the region need to get stronger uh, and ASEP is one element that's going to drive this. And, uh, uh, and ASEP will have strong impact on uh, ASEAN LDCs, uh, Cambodia, Laos, and uh, Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar can be uh, either to solve its own internal problems, but uh, Cambodia and Laos, especially Cambodia is expected to take off quite significantly followed by Laos because of the railway that's going to come from China all the way to Vientiane, going all the way to Thailand, uh, to Bangkok. So that uh, is going to propel uh, uh, Cambodia and Laos to the next stage because of heavy linkages between Cambodia and uh, China. So the CJK impact will be very significant uh, for ASEAN LDCs. And uh, Vietnam is already gaining a lot of momentum, uh, both in terms of uh, 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 three elements they, they are trying to do. One is infrastructure connectivity, and two, uh, institutional reforms uh, in terms of coordinating the national to the sub-national level, in terms of decentralization, what Indonesia is trying to do, if they do that, then they're going to have pick up very fast. The third element is uh, try to bring urban sectors into trade. So you're going to see a lot of new cities uh, are going to grow faster uh, in Vietnam, just what we observe in China. And Indonesia is following the same framework uh, where uh, uh, the president has decided to move the capital to Kalimantan. So you're going to see the impact uh, of Indonesia coming together. So the question is, uh, Malaysia. Malaysia has to rectify and push itself faster into this dimension. Uh, that is very, very important for us. 
and seriously look into the structural transformation because Malaysia is right in the center with good infrastructure, good connectivity. Uh, the, the weakness of Vietnam now is human capital. Uh, it's very centered in lower secondary uh, education. Malaysia is centered in much more better. So investing in infrastructure and human capital will be very fundamental for Malaysia. And if they do that, you're going to see the takeoff stage coming back to uh, Malaysia uh, in terms of the new dimension uh, of uh, global value chain. So uh, Tansri Adia explained this, uh, and our objective is still move to FTA APP uh, uh, in terms of uh, greater trade integration itself. Uh, but as you can see, India is not anywhere here uh, because it's just an observer in APAC. So we need to engage uh, India. Uh, maybe the Indo-Pacific uh, dimension might be one uh, element that uh, can be discussed. Uh, quickly, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, uh, effects uh, in terms of GVC uh, will be very important. And uh, the GVC is resilient at this time, uh, driven by China. So the CJK impact uh, through RCEP uh, will, should strengthen us even further. A uh, few things quickly. I will spend the last five minutes uh, on this uh, impact of COVID. Um, sorry, Professor. Did, yeah. I'm so sorry, Professor. If you can just shorten the presentation for yeah, about sure. two to three minutes, that would be yeah, much sure. appreciated. Thank so you. quickly, uh, the COVID uh, will have this element. Uh, digital uh, transformation will be important. Human capital transformation, because uh, uh, we are getting closer to a jobless recovery. So the human capital might be very important for us to accelerate uh, uh, these uh, transformation and skills transformation is important. And the last element is uh, how we're going to manage the movement of people and movement of goods. And as I mentioned, the CJK impact will be very significant for us. And uh, the, uh, again, uh, quickly, the rules of origin, uh, ASEP sets a single rules of origin that allow goods to move across countries, 15 countries, and uh, it says a co-sharing rule. So the co-sharing rule has a very strong element of uh, allowing market access and allow movement of goods. And uh, uh, quickly, uh, in terms of uh, digital transformation of services, uh, it's very important. And for Malaysia, that transformation will be very critical for the SMEs themselves. Um, and uh, there are opportunities uh, in terms of traditional services. And uh, this is where ASEP need to come for economic cooperation, looking to traditional services of tourism, uh, logistic aviation, where there's a large element of movement of people issues. And uh, that can have to be addressed under ASEP itself. So uh, quickly, uh, uh, ASEAN lacks uh, digital infrastructure. We need to improve that. Uh, uh, we have weak human capital uh, that also need to be uh, improved. A digital uh, digital information uh, information flows and uh, digital protocols for trade protocols are very very important. Uh, so that's what. I, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chandra, uh, for the insights as well as uh, putting the points that Malaysia is actually at the central positions of all these uh, regional transactions. Um, now, moving on, let's have a uh, discussion or a presentation by Ms. Arividya Arimutu. Ms. Arividya is a Senior Director of Strategic Negotiations that will be discussing and sharing her experiences representing Malaysia particularly in the CPTPP negotiations, as well as discussing the current hurdles to Malaysia for ratifying these agreements. Please, Miss. Thank you, Zukri, and uh, allow me to begin by thanking Ideas for the kind invitation. It's certainly a privilege to be in the company of such esteemed speakers, uh, particularly my mentor and guide, Tansri Rebecca. So it's always an honor to share the stage with her, despite this being a virtual stage. And uh, Zukri, you mentioned in your remarks that I'll be discussing the hurdles. Let me put a positive spin to it. I'll be discussing the status updates and the progress we are making. So on that note, and before we proceed to the substantive part of my presentation, I just wanted to address uh, some of the points raised earlier on RCEP. I think Tansri and Prof did a very good job. Their presentations were very comprehensive on RCEP. 
I just want to raise two pertinent points. One, I think it's important to recognize and underscore that RCEP and CPTPP should and can coexist. Uh, these agreements are complementary to each other. They are not in competition with each other. And therefore, as a METI official, uh, I will not be making an assessment as to which one is a better agreement or which one is a more inclusive agreement. In my view, they offer different market access opportunities into uh, different trade partners, and therefore they are equally important. So on that note, let's move to my presentation. Let me try and share my screen. Sarah, how do I do this? Yeah, well, okay. Share. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And then, uh, but it's not in the slide. Yes. Okay. Just give me a minute. Okay. So my presentation today will be looking at Malaysia's state of play with regards to the CPTPP. So I will be focusing on CPTPP, but should there be questions on RCEP later on, I'd be happy to address them. I think Tricia noted in her opening remarks about the stance of the current administration with regards to free trade agreements, and I suppose that includes the CPTPP as well. The former prime minister in his engagements with industries, and he was in MITI twice to meet with the industries, and he stressed that uh, the CPTPP is a high quality, high standard agreement, and we will in due course determine a pragmatic way forward for this FTA. MITI was then mandated to explore all possible options for us to facilitate the ratification of this agreement. And uh, MITI is currently working within this mandate. We are looking at the options that we have with regards to ratification and uh, also the costs and benefits of this agreement, which we will be presenting to cabinet at some point. Now, the CPTPP is called the gold standard FTA. So in that sense, I do believe it is not a reflection of what we can do. It is an indication of what we should aspire to do as a country. So if we want to be a developed country, we should start behaving like one. And uh, therefore the CPTPP sets high quality, not only in terms of the concessions we are making, but also in terms of the rules and disciplines contained in that agreement. It confers a preferential treatment to all its members. It has a comprehensive scope. It covers 30 chapters on products and services. It also includes rules that are not covered elsewhere. So we have disciplines on electronic commerce, on SOEs, as well as additional rules on IPR, intellectual property rights, as well as technical barriers to trade. The CPTPP includes new areas for Malaysia, and uh, that includes uh, government procurement, labor, environment, as well as SOEs. The current membership is 11 countries, but of course the UK has started her formal accession process. So soon it will grow into 12 countries and possibly more with others expressing interest to become a part of the CPTPP agreement. It is open to all APAC economies, but others may join if it is agreed to by existing members. I think this was touched upon earlier. So while APAC economies are welcome to join, others may also do so provided the existing parties agree. So this is the reason why the UK will soon become a party to the CPTPP, assuming of course they complete the accession negotiations and they are able to comply with the standards and rules contained in the CPTPP. So it's not only open to APAC, but for others as well, so long as the existing parties agree to that aspiring economy to become a part of the agreement. So under the CPTPP, members will implement the original TPPA between them. So TPPA refers to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. This is the agreement with the US in it until President Trump decided to withdraw. So now we have the CPTPP with a limited number of provisions that will be suspended. So the text of the CPTPP is very similar to the TPP agreement minus the 22 provisions which we have suspended and these are mostly related to intellectual property rights. These suspensions will remain in place until the parties agree to end them by consensus. And this is an important distinction to make because I do believe that in the past there have been concerns raised as to whether these suspensions will be removed if and when the US enters the agreement again. That's not the case. So the suspensions will be in place 
until all parties agree to end them. So it's not a condition or a situation where if the US enters, automatically the suspensions get removed. That's not the case. And therefore the CPTPP text should be read together with the text of the original TPPA. As I mentioned earlier, much of it is the original TPPA with suspensions. So for us to get a comprehensive picture of the rules and disciplines contained in the CPTPP agreement, we will need to read it together with the original TPPA. In 2018, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam signed the CPTPP. The agreement entered into force for seven ratified countries in December 2018, and for Vietnam, it entered into force in January 2019. Recently, Peru submitted her instrument of ratification, and therefore the agreement will enter into force for Peru this month on the 19th. This makes Peru the eighth country to ratify the CPTPP, and three countries until today remain as signatories, and these are Malaysia, Brunei, and Chile. So as signatories, we do not enjoy the preferential tariff rates offered in the agreement, and we also cannot block any consensus made by parties in all the CPTPP meetings. Now, the effect of this will be when we discuss the UK accession negotiations. So if parties agree that the UK can accede into the CPTPP, Malaysia, Brunei, and Chile will not be in a position to block that decision. Now, of course, it is not in the nature of Malaysian negotiators to be blocking decisions. So I'm pretty certain we will be welcoming UK into the fold, but uh, there will be limitations in terms of the role that Malaysia will assume when it comes to market access negotiations with the UK. So there will be an impact to us. These are the chapters contained in the CPTPP. Now the standard legal chapters and the traditional trade issues are the kind of chapters you would see across a number of FTAs that Malaysia has entered into. But the CPTPP also includes new issues and this includes competition, labor, environment, development, SMEs, regulatory coherence, transparency, as well as anti-corruption. Uh, the chapters in bold could be those chapters of interest to ideas as well as our audience today. And uh, all of this text is available online on MITI's website. You can go to the FTA portal on MITI's website to access this text. Uh, you could have a read and uh, if you wish to engage MITI further on any discussions, I would be happy to facilitate. What are the general updates that I can share today? So I think many of us are aware that we need to amend some of our laws to put the CPTPP as well as the RCEP into force. So we will need to amend these laws to ensure that we are able to ratify these agreements. On that front, uh, work is progressing well. And um, I did a quick Google search last night to look at what is publicly available on this. And uh, I saw a statement from Dato Sri Mustafa Muhammad back in 2017, where he talked about a total of 19 laws need to be amended for us to ratify this agreement. Now, I'm happy to share that we are working with a much more manageable number now. So it's certainly not 19. A lot of amendments have happened, and it's very interesting to note that some of those laws were amended not only because of our CPTPP obligations, but also as part of our own continuous improvement process, our own domestic reforms. Uh, that's particularly, particularly true for laws related to labor. So I think that's a very important distinction to make. I, I've had personally met with ministry officials who have told me that whether you ratify the CPTPP or not, we are going to proceed with our amendments because we need to bring our laws on par with international practices. So that is a good development on that front. So work on that front is progressing well. Secondly, stakeholder consultations. Now, I mentioned earlier that we intend to go to cabinet at some point this year. And we will be consolidating the findings of our stakeholder consultations to be presented to cabinet. Now, these stakeholder consultations extend to state governments as well as private sector associations, 
and other stakeholders from other ministries. So MIT is also involved with engagements undertaken by other ministries to meet with their own stakeholders, and that extends to civil societies as well as NGOs. And we have those discussions, we address questions from them, and we facilitate the understanding of Malaysia's rights and obligations under the CPTPP. With the private sector, it was also important to help them understand that within the CPTPP, we are talking about a catch-up approach. I think Tan Sri touched upon this earlier when she talked about the CPTPP is already into its third year of entry into force, which means if and when Malaysia chooses to ratify and the agreement enters into force for Malaysia, let's say we do it next year in 2022, that will be year four for tariff concessions. That will not be year one for Malaysia. So it's important for us to highlight this to the private sector as well, so that they are aware of the, not only of the tariff concessions and the preferential treatments they will be getting in uh, the CPTPP countries, but also the commitments that Malaysia has to make, which means we are not gonna do year one tariff reduction, we are going to do year four tariff reduction. So we need to get the private sector inputs and feedback on that front as well. Some concerns have been raised, of course, and all of these findings will form the uh, cabinet mandate, which we will seek uh, from cabinet later on. So we will be presenting the benefits as well as the cost of this agreement. We will be making an assessment of whether the benefits outweigh the cost, and then we will seek a detailed and clear mandate from the cabinet on the way forward for the CPTPP. Now, looking from MITI's perspective, are we doing well when it comes to amending our laws? We do think that uh, the ministries have a specific timeline and work plan in place. We are making steady strides on that front. When we look at the stakeholder consultations, much of it has been garnering positive responses. So in our assessment, we remain on track in our efforts to ratify the CPTPP, provided, of course, we get the mandate from the cabinet. Now, what are the domestic processes for the CPTPP to enter into force for Malaysia? As I mentioned earlier, we are consolidating the findings of our stakeholder consultations. And some of the consultations with the state governments are still ongoing. So we will need to look at the outcomes of those engagement sessions as well. On top of that, uh, we will need to sit down again with the ministries to look at the progress that they are making with regards to amending the laws under their purview. And what are their plans when it comes to tabling those amendments to the parliament? So once we have details on that front, we will seek cabinet mandate on the ratification of CPTPP. If the cabinet agrees for Malaysia to ratify, we will need to submit a ratification instrument to the CPTPP depository, which is New Zealand. Now, that instrument is basically a one-pager to inform the CPTPP membership that Malaysia is now ready to implement the agreement. Once we do so, the CPTPP will enter into force 60 days after the submission of the instrument of ratification. So this is what happened with Peru. Peru submitted her instrument of ratification 60 days prior to 19th of September, and therefore the agreement will enter into force for Peru on the 19th. With regards to the UK's accession into the CPTPP, earlier this year in February, the UK deposited her formal application for her to accede into the CPTPP. On the 2nd of June, CPTPP countries unanimously decided to begin the accession process with the UK. So these decisions are made at the CPTPP commission meeting, which is a ministerial meeting attended by ministers from all 11 CPTPP countries. The accession working group will be established soon. And this is a dedicated mechanism for negotiations between the UK and the CPTPP parties. The first AWG meeting will convene soon, likely in late September. And Malaysia has also been invited to observe the proceedings of this accession working group meeting. As I mentioned earlier, our role is limited when it comes to accession negotiations and market access talks. Uh, but we continue to discuss with the CPTPP parties, and by parties, I mean the countries who have ratified the agreement. We continue to discuss with them 
to allow the signatories a more significant role, a more meaningful role in the accession negotiations. So let's see what the outcomes of those discussions will be. Now, why should we ratify the CPTPP? I think a lot of these points have been covered by the earlier presenters, but I thought it's important to stress that this is an agreement that goes beyond just tariffs. It's an integrated market of 500 million people with a combined output of 10 trillion US dollars, and it represents 13.5% of the world economy. All of this will grow when UK enters into the CPTPP. So you're talking about market access opportunities, not just in 11 countries, but in a growing number of countries. And that is something that Malaysia needs to recognize. It also enhances governance in a number of economic sectors. This is an agreement that has a specific chapter on anti-corruption and transparency. It talks about adopting the right code of conduct, the right code of ethics, including for civil servants, to ensure that uh, cor corruptive practices do not exist within the trade and investment ecosystem. So it also talks about the corrosive effects of corrup corruption and how it impacts trade and investment transactions. So we need to put in place certain mechanisms to ensure that there is good governance uh, in the CPTPP countries. Secondly, it strengthens economic cooperation and capacity building, including for SMEs among member countries. Now, we have seen examples of this with Vietnam. There has been 300 SMEs from Vietnam who have received capacity building and technical assistance from Canada. So they get assistance from the Canadian government to help them to comply with Canadian standards. So SMEs from Vietnam are now able to export to Canada thanks to the capacity building efforts from Canada. So these are the kind of capacity building that we are missing out on. On that note, I think it's also important to highlight that within the CPTPP, there are the donor countries. These are countries who give out technical assistance and capacity building programs, countries like Canada, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. And there are countries who receive such capacity building programs, including Vietnam, of course, but also Malaysia, Peru, Mexico. So since Malaysia is not part of the ratified membership, we are not able to receive such capacity building programs. Third, it promotes adoption of international standards in labor, environment, and IPR. And this is where some of the amendments stem from. But as I mentioned earlier, we are also amending our laws because we want to bring them on par with international best practices and not just because of our obligations under the CPTPP. Next, the agreement enables SMEs to source cost-effective raw materials, parts and components. Of course, you have a bigger market to choose from and the products that are being traded across CPTPP will attract 0% duty. Almost 99% of products will attract 0% duty when the agreement is realized by uh, 2034 for most countries. It also reduces the amount of time that exporters have to wait. To, in order to obtain their goods customs clearance. This is part of the trade facilitation efforts that have been included into the CPTPP agreement. So it also improves ease of doing business. And some of this is linked to the earlier point on transparency, on anti-corruption, to make sure that uh, goods are cleared using proper governance mechanisms. What are the consequences if we do not ratify the CPTPP? Of course, lost export opportunities to three new countries, Canada, Mexico, and Peru. We do not have any FTAs with these countries, either bilaterally or through ASEAN. The only market access, market access concessions that Malaysia has obtained for us to enter these countries is through the CPTPP. We also risk becoming a less attractive investment destination for investors. We have seen a preference by investors to invest in countries with investment protection and better standards of transparency. We have seen how Vietnam received a total of uh, 9 billion US dollars in FDIs in the year 2019, and almost 25% of those investments came from CPTPP countries. So if you look at the numbers and the fact that it only took a year for Vietnam to see this kind of results, these are remarkable indeed. We will also not be um, able- Ms. Arividya, if, if we can just try to shorten the presentation for about two minutes, uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we will also not be able to participate in the accession negotiations. I've covered this earlier. 
and uh, our exports will not have preferential access to the growing CPTPP market and therefore we will become less competitive compared to Singapore and Vietnam. What are the arguments against uh, CPTPP? I will quickly cover this because uh, uh, I have to yield my time to Zol. <laughs> Of course, we've heard arguments on ISDS. We've heard arguments that there could be the possibility of increase in prices of medicines. And of course, in terms of key policies, will the government be able to preserve policy space in areas such as affirmative action, Bumiputra agenda, the role of GLCs, GPs, as well as SMEs? Now, to quickly address those concerns, we think, and this is Miti's perspective, ISDS can coexist with policy space. Within the CPTPP agreement, there are reservations and carve-outs put in place to ensure that policy space is preserved and maintained. The CPTPP also reaffirms the party's rights to undertake measures necessary to protect their people's health. In addition, we also need to recognize that prices of medicines are not driven by patents alone. So we cannot say that the patent protection system alone is the sole cause of increased prices in medicines. There are systemic issues which we need to address, including domestic procurement policies of medicines. Last but not least, on policy space, we have specific carve-outs. This is particularly true for the Bumiputra agenda. We have carve-outs that say Malaysia can maintain or introduce any measure necessary to preserve and continue our Bumiputra policies. I think this is my last slide. So this is just to quickly highlight that there have been very strong and vocal calls from the private sector for MITI to rectify the CPTPP. Uh, MITI has been listening to these calls. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will put all of our findings together and uh, seek cabinet mandate, hopefully by end of this year. On that note, thank you, Zupri, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ari, for, for the presentation in, in enlightening us the, the updates, the, the progress uh, of the ministry in towards ratifying uh, the CPTPP. Right. Um, thank you to all of our listeners. We've got tons of questions. Uh, we'll try to, to address that within this short period of time. Uh, I will keep my, my reflection and my discussion short with, with the panelists. Uh, perhaps I think the most um, the most uh, striking uh, attention yeah, that everyone needs to know mm -hmm. is that with the effect of the local businesses and the small scale economies are affected and slowed mm -hmm. down by the pandemic. How far can that we actually can we assure these SMEs and these small scale businesses that by ratifying CPTPP, yeah, uh, it will not that. further exacerbate the local businesses. I think the public needs some sort of assurance out of these theoretical presentations and all of these negotiations, how do we actually can, can garner the support of the public, explain to the public that uh, either CPTPP or RCEP is the way to go um, to, towards uh, the post pandemic. Um, if any one of you would just want to reflect on this statement. Okay, uh, let me let me try uh, uh, see whether I can address that uh, the question. Uh, yeah. the, the most interesting part about uh, structural it... transformation uh, is uh, it can it have to be implemented when there are shocks. Uh, when there are economic shocks, uh, the impact of uh, uh, the transformation uh, 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 and the uh, importance of uh, uh, reforming the economy itself becomes very, very fundamental. Uh, with RCEP and also with CPTPP, uh, we are in a very good uh, position to actually reform to a better uh, outcome. Huh? Let me explain. I agree, completely agree on this, that Malaysia is in a very unique space uh, to create the complementarity between CPTPP and RCEP itself. Uh, both the trade integration and the regional integration itself. And uh, CPTPP gives you the element of a digital economy and able to transform to that level. The interesting part about free trade agreement is that uh, 15 countries under RCEP came with a common framework how we can move the next set of agenda in trade. So without that agenda, if you want to do structural transformation of your economy during a, a shock like this, it's going to be very, very costly. So can you imagine all the 15 countries adopt this and move the economy, the region itself to that frontier? That means uh, we will be achieving that element itself. 
without free trade agreement, the cost of adjustment is very high for Malaysia because digitalization is taking place. Uh, with the persistence of the shock, uh, the, uh, the uh, businesses are already transforming themselves. So there are a lot of large companies are already transforming a lot of the activities moving from physical movement of space to a virtual movement of space. So there will be a social impact. There will be a labor market impact. So the free trade agreement with the right alignment of domestic and regional policies, we can nicely transform and help those SMEs to move into this space. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the greatest impact of any free trade agreement is trade facilitation and domestic reform. So Malaysia is a very, very unique position. I can't see any of the ASEAN countries in that position. Uh, even Vietnam is not in that position. Uh, rightly pointed out, FDI is following into Vietnam. But keep in mind, uh, Vietnam is driven by Korea. Korea is heavily investing uh, the multinationals into Vietnam itself. Japan is heavily investing into Thailand. That's their strategy. So Malaysia have to use a CPTPP and ASEAN to integrate and create more space for itself in the GBC itself. And it's in a very, very unique position. Infrastructure, human capital, we are one of the best educational institutions, and we already have the kind of industries we want to transform. So I, I don't see, other than institutional issues that raised earlier, if you do the right institutional reform, I think Malaysia will be in a very good place to take off. Yeah, can I just jump in and say that, you know, uh, the, there's a place for government in all this, and there's a place for the regional push for us to reform. And I agree with Prof. Um, you, you can have an FTA, but that FTA is not a panacea. It just provides you that opportunity, that leeway. You know, if you sign 20 trade agreements, but you do nothing to facilitate the flow of goods in the, in the economy itself. So, from, from the, so, so, for example, from the factory to the port, let's just take that. If there are umpteen barriers and pain points along this logistics chain, that ain't gonna help you. The duty-free access is not going to help you. So it has to be done in concert. You know, we need to, to look at um, the, whole, the whole picture, uh, look at it holistically. Yes, you, you provide that opportunity for the goods to cross borders. So you work with customs across the region through your FTAs, you get customs uh, harmonization of processes, rules, regulations, etc. But domestic uh, transformation must still take place. So you cannot say, oh, you know, what's the point of signing the agreement? We didn't get anything. Excuse me, you also got to look at what you have in place. You know, so ease of doing business is the responsibility of government. Working together with the private sector, you know, and, and, and it's, it's no government can do this alone. You need to work with the private sector. That's for the domestic. And then you know, the work that we are doing with customs, with other regional bodies and, you know, our partners, that takes us to that next level. So, I mean, keep this in mind now. Huh? Thanks. Yes, Ari, you want to say something? You're, you're muted. Okay, thank you, Zol. I was having a little bit of problem with the mouse. And uh, I must also thank uh, Tan Sri for already addressing uh, much of your question. It almost felt like I was transported back to 2014 when Tan Sri was the chief negotiator for the Malaysia EU FTA negotiations. Um, on SMEs, I think it's important to recognize certain things. One, if you look at the number of SMEs in this country, you're talking about almost 1 million establishments. 1 million business establishments in this country are SMEs. However, they only account for about 17 to 18% of our exports. So there are systemic issues which we need to address. Why are SMEs not exporting? How do we improve their export capacity? And this has very little to do with FTAs. So this question about whether SMEs will be able to compete, whether they will be able to export, I think those are systemic issues which we need to address. 
Secondly, if you look at the nature of SMEs in Malaysia, many of them become vendors to supply chains. So they are either tier one, tier two, or tier three vendors. So in that sense, they are still indirectly exporting because the final products being exported do contain inputs from SMEs. So all of this need to come together. And I think as Tansri has pointed out, it is the role of governments to create that framework, to create that market access opportunities, which is what the CPTPP and RCEP does. But for SMEs to, to actually benefit from them, of course, we can facilitate training. If they think it's difficult for them to comply with the standards in Canada or Australia, we can help them to comply. We can provide technical assistance and capacity building. But there must also be specific efforts, dedicated efforts undertaken by the SMEs themselves. And the fact that SME exports have only hovered around 17 to 18% in the past five, six years, have very little to do with FTAs, but rather certain systemic issues which we need to address. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you for the uh, feedback and insights. All right, let's quickly jump in into the questions. Uh, for everyone else's information, I uh, am assisted uh, by Azizul Hazik, uh, an intern at Ideas, to collect and to gather these questions. Uh, we try to actually uh, address these questions, but if it's not, then we we'll definitely deposit all these questions and then we will we'll seek to review this question from time to time. So uh, if you look at the Q&A, uh, box. Uh, I think um, from, from my uh, discussion and reflection, we probably have answered a bit of Sanya as well as Sean's uh, questions in terms of the criticisms and what should be the red flags that we should be worried about CPTPP and RCEP. But more important, how can we actually go into the solutions of it by probably tackling on the systemic issue as what Ari have mentioned. Now, the next question is by Aru Kianadan Joseph, uh, is on actually transparency. Uh, in, in, is this the context of bilateral trade agreement in conflict with regional consensus of trade policies? Certain economies are not in compliance with IP, International Intellectual Property Rights, and Quality Control QC policies, as well as labor abuse. An importing country from one block will be conflict with non-member country from another block. So the issue and policies of one block might not hold with trade policies another. So I, I think um, Aru Kenaden is asking about how do we actually meddle the differences of policy under uh, the, the, the banner of transparency. Uh, between one country to, to another. So uh, perhaps any of the panel would like to take this question? Okay, uh, let, let me try this, uh, this question. Uh, uh, the issue of transparency uh, is very important for the markets. Uh, there's two elements in the market. One is uh, the uh, various uh, stake player, uh, uh, stakeholders playing their role in the market. So a state-owned enterprise, they are local uh, private enterprises and so on and so forth. And then you have the national enterprise and international uh, firms entering the market itself. So the issue of transparency to us is both in terms of regulation and also in terms of how the market is going to function. Intellectual property rights, uh, in terms of the uh, role of the uh, SOEs, uh, government link corporations, all these elements are very important for us. Uh, how uh, the, uh, the rules and the regulations are very clear and we adopt the best practices. That is very clear. That is what transparency is about. And free trade agreement bring this in, into the light. For example, in CPTPP, uh, the transparency issue is very, very clear. That's why it's, it's a living agreement that put us as a very high agenda that we put up for treatment of firms, treatment, treatment of uh, national firms, international firms and how competition itself is been defined. So these 15 countries in uh, uh, ASEAN has agreed that this is how trade should be at the frontier in terms of how international domestic firms should participate in the market. So it's very clear in terms of how firms will invest in the economy. It creates clear political and clear uh, agenda for us in how to move trade itself, how to have proper exchange, proper investment itself. That is how we define transparency, very much in terms of the market and transparency in terms of regulation. 
I just want to quickly highlight three points. Number one, transparency requirements do not only exist in FTAs, but they also exist at the WTO. So the requirement to notify the WTO, for example, is a transparency obligation. If you think about it, you have to notify certain measures to the WTO. Therefore, you are being transparent. So it's not only in FTAs that we have to look into transparency requirements, but there is already a transparency requirement for us as a WTO member. Of course, in some FTAs, we take those transparency commitments a little further. But we also need to recognize, and this is my second point, there are countries with whom we do not have FTAs, the US, for example, but we are improving our labor standards to be able to access the US market. The same is true for the EU. We have to put in place certain environmental measures so that we are able to access the EU market. And with both these uh, examples, we do not have FTAs with them. But we are fulfilling certain transparency obligations because we want to access those markets. So FTAs, yes, they contain uh, certain transparency requirements, but uh, that's not the only reason we do it. Uh, and last but not least, I think there was a question, I think he's talking about what if you're trading with a country that is not part of an FTA and therefore they are not transparent about the measures. So Malaysia has to be transparent, uh, but your trading partner with whom you do not have an FTA or for whatever strange reasons, they are not a WTO member, so they're not fulfilling the transparency requirements. Uh, will that not uh, make it more difficult for us to compete? I think that's where he's coming from. Uh, but again, I think this goes back to the earlier point. If we want to be a developed country, we need to start behaving like one. And transparency requirements have proven useful not only for international trade transactions, but also for our own domestic market. We have citizens who demand transparency now. So I think that is something we as a government need to respond to. Thank you. Yeah, just, just uh, I agree with everything that, that Prof and, and Ari have said. I mean, uh, transparency, governance, Top of top of whatever needs to be done as, as, as an economy. Now, yeah, you can you can choose to ignore all those international rules and regulations. You can choose to to not be transparent. But coming back to Malaysia, Malaysia is a very small market in that in that context. Huh? We we are an open economy, whether we like it or not. So it's incumbent upon us to do what is best for our people, for our business, and and transparency. What's the big deal about transparency? If you are rule abide, if you have rule of law in your in your country, what's the problem? You know, so so sometimes it boggles me when when folks talk about or or, or, or push back a bit on on transparency and governance. We are open, um, we are a global player, whether we like it or not. So those rules will apply to us one way or the other. The other point that that we need to un, uh, to emphasize here is that when you negotiate free trade agreements, it's not about tomorrow, you know, it's not market access for tomorrow or the next five years even. It's about the long-term transformation of your economy. How do you see yourself 10, 20, 30 years from now? You see yourself still like this, you know, with the same rules and regulations, come on. I mean, we are better than that, you know? So it's really thinking long-term, thinking about the welfare of our children, our grandchildren, about posterity. I think that should be the focus and not to, re re you know, go into our little, uh, you know, uh, if you don't say a, a shell, coconut shell, and happily co confine ourselves to that coconut shell, not, not uh, concerned about what's going on in the rest of the world. So really, uh, we are an open economy. So there are things that, that we must do to fulfill our responsibility to our people. So, so on a positive note, Tansri, by, by ratifying is actually preparing ourselves, making the structural adjustment in the country, making reforms in the country. So it's a push factor to actually elevate our country to the next level. Right. I think that's, that is a very good statement for us to ponder upon. Now, two questions, uh, Tansri, um, from an anonymous attendee. With the possibility of economic decoupling and with China's new dual circulation, how will this board for the future accept? And I think going straight to the second question, it is no secret that Australia has been facing economic repercussions from what can only be described as retaliatory trade measures by China. So if we are joining um, AFSEP, uh, how can actually AFSEP or FTAs like this uh, address such action in the event that we are probably facing this situation? Thanks, Sri. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going at it from a purely policy maker perspective. This is where RCEP or CPTPP provide that platform 
for us to engage directly, really. And then you have the other parties as well in the room, helping to you know smooth the those tensions. Bilateral, yes, but looking at it from a bigger picture, more regional perspective, getting the business involved. I think that's the value that that you get from a, a free trade agreement. And also, you know, really, what happens uh, sometimes um, in in the in the media is quite different from what happens behind the scenes when, when negotiators meet. There, there is a lot of this uh, discussion that just on that point. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things I find, I'm not sure Ari and, and Prof how you feel about is the virtual environment has its limitations. You know, the value of, of negotiations and, and uh, international collaboration is that ability to meet face to face, to try and pep, pull aside, small group discussions, you know, and, and reading body language, helping to build those bonds uh, to, to, you know, deal with exactly issues like this, you know, the tensions that you, you think, bring it back into the room, into a smaller group. I, I really find um, some, the constraints when it comes to the virtual environment. I cannot do that kind of pull aside and manage to have, well, you're having 15, 15 or 20 people in the room, you want to take out this little, the ones having those tensions into a smaller room and have those discussions, finding language that folks can agree upon. Uh, that, that I really, really missed, you know, when, in, in this environment. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, perhaps, you know, what is happening at the negotiation stage is not actually well um, told to the public, you know, the public might not really understand. And that is why it's easy for us to jump on, onto the perception and some false accusation. Because uh, in one of the questions uh, set by the anonymous attendee, I, I think he or she is concerned about how many laws does Malaysia have to change in order to comply with, with RCEP? How many laws do we have to change to comply with CPTPP? Because I think people have been I, I don't know, perhaps they do not know, or perhaps there's no a proper channel of communicating to the public uh, on these kinds of law reform. So um, Ari, uh, what, what should we do here? Because I think uh, from the question that I've just glanced through, I might not understand in its full context. I think uh, the, the public is just wanting to know some little, little details, but it's really important to them uh, for their the nature and the survival of their business, and especially with these lost questions. Over to you, Ari. Thank you, Zokri. I think uh, I just want to highlight two points. The first one is I think we need to recognize that when we talk about amending laws to comply with CPTPP, it's not that the agreement per se requires you to amend the law so that you can comply with Article 6.7 of the CPTPP agreement. No, the CPTPP calls for us to accede into certain, let's say, international treaties or for us to recognize the core obligations contained in certain international treaties. This is particularly true for the labor-related law amendments. So, for example, and Tansri know this, uh, Tansri knows this, out of the uh, eight core conventions at the ILO, we are only party to five. So, the CPTPP is not asking you to ratify those conventions or exceed into those conventions. But the CPTPP recognizes that there are certain international principles with regards to labor standards that are contained in these core conventions. And those principles somehow or other need to be reflected in your laws. If you look at some of our laws that uh, discriminate women, for example, from working in the mines, this is a 1955 law. The, I think uh, this is the Employment Act 1955, if I'm not mistaken. And there are provisions in there which are simply outdated, which we need to improve and upgrade anyways, irrespective of the CPTPP agreement. So these are instances that uh, perhaps you are right, perhaps we should communicate this better to the public. Uh, unfortunately, none of these laws are under METI. If it's under METI, I would be happy to do those engagements on a daily basis. But these laws are under the purview of different ministries, and I am not at liberty to share a lot of details. But I would be happy to, to connect those ministries to some of these uh, stakeholders. METI can be there too. We can then address if there are specific questions on some of these amendments. We would be happy to do that. Uh, secondly, I think uh, you talked about uh, the trade coercion. Again, it's important to underscore that uh, 
The nature of trade dealings aren't always about going to dispute at the WTO or triggering the FTA dispute settlement mechanism. And I think that's something I need to address because I get this a lot. But there's a dispute provision. Yes, but how many times do we use it? Look at all the FTAs we have in place. We have 14 FTAs in place. And I can tell you we've not gone to dispute in any one of them. So the nature of trade is as such that you will choose to arbitrate, you will choose to uh, mediate, and you will choose to discuss with your trading partner before you get to that dispute stage. And uh, I must say the chances of that happening in my assessment is fairly low. So I think we have to we have to recognize that. Do we have problems with some of our trading partners? Of course we do. Even today we get complaints about our certificates of origin not being recognized or having to go through another round of tests or another round of conformity assessment exercise in the country of the trading partner. But we're not going to go to dispute immediately because of these issues. We will try and resolve them at the officials level or even at the minister's level. Sometimes all it takes is your minister writing a letter to his counterpart and certain issues get resolved. So there there are many, many alternative measures in place for us to deal with these trade issues. And I think it's important to highlight that. Yeah, I think more reason for us to do this kind of dialogue so that the citizens are actually aware of these possible consequences. Uh, Professor Chandra, um, one of the questions asked about what is actually trade facilitation, because you mentioned that uh, in your presentation. And there's also another question by Jaidip Singh that which I try to actually marry with trade facilitation. I asked about the extent, uh, does what extent does RCEP really improve trade facilitation in ASEAN? And then one of the biggest challenges is because of these non-tariff measures. And he gives the example of the ASEAN single window, ASEAN self-certification schemes. So how does actually RCEP add value in terms of accelerating what is in place beyond repeating what ASEAN members are already party to under the WTO and ASEAN FTA. I think perhaps what is it new about this RCEP uh, that could is not perhaps something that exists in the previous FTA. Over to you, Prof. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. Uh, let me uh, start with uh, the earlier uh, answer. That is exactly what trip facilitation is about. Uh, that means you're looking at your laws and looking and, uh, uh, and carefully studying your laws and reducing the regulatory burden in the economy itself. A lot of the, the issue that's been raised earlier is very interesting uh, one. 1950, you have a law that helped you to do something for the woman uh, in 1950s. How relevant is that currently? And this free trade agreement like CPTPP actually asks you to go and look at that law and try to rectify that law that can help us, the SMEs, to participate better in the trade itself. So what does free trade agreement does is it puts out a lot of elements us, uh, to us to actually go and visit the old laws and put it to the best frontier as best as possible. Not to disadvantage our SMEs, but actually create advantage for them because, let me give you a good example. Why Vietnam is rising very, very fast? Because they reform, they look at the regulatory burden and reform faster and faster. A good example is educational services. They allow foreign institutions and foreign universities to set up in Vietnam itself. And that allows them to accelerate faster and faster. So free trade agreement allow us to visit laws and reduce regulatory burden. And there are a lot of regulatory burdens in our, in our economy. Uh, even in, in Malaysia, the regulatory burden in education services are very, very high. So we need to visit and reform them so that we are globally competitive. That means we put our SMEs and our domestic enterprises in the best position to compete at the international frontier. And some of them are not able to compete because of this regulatory burden we have put in. And that is a very good example that given by earlier presenter that these are the laws that we need to amend. And without amending them, other countries are benefiting more from free trade agreement like Vietnam or even Indonesia. They will benefit more from this. It's not just writing a free trade agreement. Trade facilitation, uh, re reducing regulatory burden, understanding how customs movement of goods takes place, how fast you move the goods, because that's how a GVC actually functions. 
And trade facilitation is not just on manufacturing, a single window and so on. Trade facilitation is also on services, very, very fundamental for us. And how to reduce the regulatory burden of services because GVC creates service linkages. It's not just manufacturing, how fast we move from one node to the other. So how we manage our laws, the laws that put it to the frontier is very, very critical for us. So that's why free trade agreement, the lawyers are very, very important for us to make us get closer to that frontier and reduce the regulatory burden as fast as possible. The more deeper the structural reform is, customs, the border issues, movement of goods, movement of people, how fast we do, the better the domestic economy is and better for our workers to actually and our SMEs and our domestic industries participate in trade. That's what trade facilitation is about. And of course, you come with all these measures and so on. The, the earlier presentation is exactly what we need to do. We need people to sit down and study this very carefully. What are the laws we need to reform to make us competitive? Yeah, that's just a, a quick ad addition. So do you need to be in trade agreements to do the structural reform? You don't. You, you do it because you need to. But here's the, the, the assurance that comes from agreements of this sort. You have that element of predictability and rule right. of law. Because if you do it on your own, tomorrow I change, I can decide, oh, I'm not going to bother with this law. I'm going to change it. I'm going to repeal it. But that gives you that assurance. And that's why it's, it's good for investor confidence. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Governance, transparency, but rule of law and the predictability element, not just transparency, you know, to ensure that in two years time, you won't go and change your laws. You know, if you did it unilaterally, there's that danger. And that's what businesses want. They want that, that element of uh, predictability that we, 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 we're very sure rule of law will be the order of the day in your place. Thank you, Tanshwe. Again, it's about consistency of reforms and how that we can be sustainable with our, our reforms. Uh, I have a, a very good question from TV3, Faiz from TV3. Thank you for joining us, uh, Faiz. Um, and we hope other TVs are catching up this forum as well. I, I do share with these uh, uh, questions too before, uh, which I wanted to ask uh, Ari, uh, in terms of this uh, planning and coordinations, uh, in terms of the CBA, as well as the feasibility studies. So. Uh, I know that there is no specific timeline as when MITI will actually table it to the cabinet, uh, but do you have some sort of uh, a rough idea of perhaps like, you know, the rough, the rough, uh, what do you call it, the, the rough timeline, if I would say, uh, as when perhaps uh, this can be brought to the attentions of our MPs in the parliament? Well, I left my crystal ball at home today, so I can't answer your question. But um, I think, um, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we in the past, uh, it took us a bit of uh, time to, to understand uh, where the administration is with regards to free trade agreements. Uh, but I think that's no longer the case. I think uh, the current administration has made it quite clear that we will continue with our trade and business friendly policies, and we are open to mutually beneficial FTAs. So that's a good starting point. Uh, but a lot of things have to come together before we are able to go to cabinet. You noted the CBA. Yes, uh, there is a CBA that has been commissioned and uh, that should help us to understand the costs and benefits associated with the CPTPP. Uh, but we're also undertaking stakeholder consultations, as I mentioned earlier, and we have ministries working on amending the laws under their purview. So all of this needs to come together before we can go to cabinet to seek a mandate. Because as part of that mandate seeking, we will also need to present what are the costs and benefits of the CPTPP. My ambitious timeline is by end of this year. That's my ambitious timeline to at least get a cabinet directive on where we are heading with regards to uh, CPTPP. Uh, but otherwise, possibly first quarter of next year. Uh, I've also noted that without timelines, uh, things don't move very quickly. <laughs> so we are also working closely with uh, other ministries and agencies so that they also have timelines in place as to when they intend to conclude the amendments to their laws. And this is important, and I think we've discussed this in detail, not only because of the CPTPP. Uh, so in those instances, when I meet ministry officials who tell me, 
we don't care what you're going to do about CPTPP. We are going to amend our laws anyways. I'm very, very pleased because that goes to show that they are do doing this with or without trade agreements. But there are also instances where officials tell me, okay, we'll amend it, but you know, we have some time. So we have to find a balance there. Uh, but I'm happy to say that most of my counterparts at other ministries do have a work plan in place. So they, of course, it has to go through a process for you to amend the laws. First, you have to consult within the ministry, get the stakeholders, get the AG lawyers involved. Uh, then you have to go to cabinet. Then you have to go to parliament. So there's a process. But now we are working with very specific timelines. So I know, for example, uh, some of those laws could be tabled to Parliament as early as this session. Um, again, there's a queue system when it comes to Parliament. So hopefully we make the cut. We are in the queue so that the ministries can table those, those uh, legislative amendments. Thank you. Uh, it gives some sort of a positive reassurance that there, there is a, a timeline that we are working towards too. Uh, yeah, we appreciate the process more than actually the results, though we understand the results are important as well. Uh, uh, a very, I'm not sure whether this is quite a controversial question. Are the CBAs considered classified? <laughs> because I think there are people out there who once probably want, want, want to know, you know, the, the, the CBA analysis for academic reasons for, for policy reasons you know um so again um my, my question to the ministry are the cbas could not be disclosed to the public well the cba for the tpp was disclosed for the public and uh, we hope to do the same for this one as well of course i do not have the necessary clearance to say absolutely we will be declassifying it and sharing it with the public but i can share that as the cptppc and that will be the recommendation that i will be making uh, to my minister and my management and uh, given past experiences i do not see a problem in sharing the cba with the public Thank you. I think uh, if you know ideas and other think tanks and civil societies can help uh, or can work hand in hand with the ministries in terms of disseminating infos and getting the public's opinion, we call it as the PPM, the public participation mechanism, where everyone is, is involved together towards the best policies and the best practices in Malaysia, uh, I think things would definitely be greater. All right, now going on to the next question. Um, uh, we should be, be um, ending this by 12. So uh, I'm sorry if I could not answer all of these questions, but we definitely record all these questions uh, for, for our own records. Uh, there's a question by Greg McGuire. For a country to become a developed country, country needs to expand high productivity service sector. Services is also fastest growing sector trade. Previous RMK have missed targets in expanding Malaysian service sector. Um, and how can the CPTPP also expand the Malaysian service sector? I think Tansi, you, you, have, you have mentioned this, that the, these uh, international trade agreements will be the pushing factor on how that we reform, especially on the Malaysian uh, service sector. So perhaps a very, very quick on that, if there's any specific um, terms or specific articles or specific requirements that these two international agreements can push for the Malaysian service sector. Thanks, Sri. Thank you, but I think Ari is, is, will be more up to date on the services agreements. Uh, just, just to say that, um, you know, it's, it's a fine balance when it comes to services. You've got as with goods, goods, we've got a lot more experience with it. Services, liberalization, you've got one set of folks who say, uh, you know, we need to open up. And then you've got another set of folks who say, excuse me, no. You know, take, for example, medical. One group will say, yes, we, we need to have, you know, we need to open up the, the medical services side. Another group will say, excuse me, no, we've got our doctors, our nurses, our da, 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 you know, our technical bi biologists, whatever it is. So that it's a fine balance. And I know that when I was in MITI, we tried to bring the different parties together to, to find that, that balance when we are talking of our commitments, international commitments. But um, having said that, we've made quite good progress. We, we've got a negative list. So that's, that's a progress. That's progress for us. So, you know, it's, it's about taking time, making folks comfortable. We've done it with, with service, we've done it with goods to, to say, we'll get there with services, you know? If, if I can just say, in 1997, we liberalized the manufacturing sector. And oh, you know, there was so much anxiety, but it was, it, 
it did well for us. So it's time to think. It's always the fear of fear, you know, that 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 tends to hold us back. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about that balance. You need to strike a balance to ensure that uh, that no one in will lose out in a massive way, you know. But but striking that balance is important. Um, Ari, you want to add something since uh, Tansu is mentioning your name? Just just a quick on that, please. Yeah, muted. All right, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, I agree with the question posed. Of course, you have to develop the services sector. You have to improve the productivity of the services sector because uh, they have to form a majority of our GDP growth. That's part of becoming a developed country. That's part of the process. Mm -hmm. There are some services sectors that are ready. And I think if you look at uh, the, the components of our services sectors, you'll realize that it's very diverse. So even during negotiations, you will have a professional bodies or services suppliers who will come and tell you, please open up the market because we want to go there. We want to be able to go there to sell our services. Engineering services is a good example. I think in a number of FTA negotiations, they've come to us and they say, we want to be able to be, uh, uh, we want to be able to sell our services there. There are a lot of construction projects happening in this country. They need engineers, they need engineering services, and we want to be able to provide them. But there will also be services sectors who tell you, please continue to close. And I've been in this business for almost 20 years now. And for 20 years, there have been services suppliers or services providers who tell you, we are not ready. You have to continue to protect us. So I think the government has a role to play here. And uh, the challenge is, I think, finding the balance between the regulatory role and the developmental role. And a lot of the services sectors are not under the purview of METI. They are under the purview of different ministries, but their, the extent of the authority is regulation. So I think there is a gap when it comes to the developmental agenda, and uh, perhaps um, there is a role for, for METI to assume there. And once you develop the services sectors well enough, I think they will be ready for competition. I think that's when they will be okay with us opening up. And you know, we've talked about it for years now, but I suppose there are still gaps there that we need to address. Okay, so for, if I understand your, 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 your answers correctly, uh, in terms of theory, the, the METI uh, lays out all of the, what is a good thing, so why we should actually go uh, integrate with other markets in terms of regulatory, we definitely secure ourselves at the best positions, but we are still lacking in terms of the developmental uh, agenda to prepare ourselves ready for, for that uh, international market, and that gap is actually that is been worried uh, is getting uh, lots of worries from our SMEs and from our business owners out there there seems to be a, a mismatched uh, in theory why is it good and it has to be good if we have this 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 and this but in reality uh, practically speaking we are still not there yet to achieve this 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 and this so uh, I guess it if I understand th this kind of connotations rightly, and that is where uh, all of these um, worries and uh, these skeptical opinions are guarded towards uh, ratifying the, the international agreements. Uh, just a quick comment on that, Professor. Uh, uh, services is a very uh, interesting dimension. Uh, let me uh, put it in a different context, in the context of pandemic recovery and post-pandemic recovery itself. Uh, there are uh, there's two kinds of inducement in services. One is the domestic inducement. And then of course, uh, we allow free trade agreements and so on to allow us to do another inducement. So domestic inducement has three elements, uh, human capital, uh, uh, infrastructure and technology. And of course, when we talk about the regulatory role and the development role that earlier uh, uh, I was discussed, Fairly, we can look at the regulatory role and uh, try to reduce the burden as possible. But the development role has a human capital element. So there's uh, the inducement for uh, pandemic recovery from digitalization itself, artificial intelligence and industry 4.0 is intensifying significantly, especially in the, in the movement of people issue. So a lot of things are moving into a digital movement of people, a virtual movement of people which is itself is transforming the way services are going to be delivered, 
services are going to be consumed. So we are not talking about just traditional services, you know, and they will also be transforming. So from a development point of view, and then recalibrating that to a regulatory point is very important for us. So that's why we need to reduce the gap. So human capital, you just look at the human capital we have in Malaysia. Human capital can be accelerated significantly. We're not talking about the educational reform. We're talking of people that are already working, they need training, new set of skills. Without the human capital to unbundle their skills in the third stage unbundling in the GVC, Malaysia will lose the services competitiveness. So that becomes very, very important. The human capital, how is going to transform, how you're going to create the domestic inducement. So we don't need trade, free trade for this. Technology itself is allowing us to do this. What free trade allows us to do is to facilitate this transformation faster. So we need connectivity, infrastructure. We need uh, human capital and we need technology. These are three elements currently we need uh, significantly very important for services transformation in the digital uh, environment and in the post pandemic recovery. It's not just manufacturing. In fact, manufacturing becomes service five because manufacturing is using a lot of the products to be service five. A lot of them products are not just selling new product, they, pro they are bundling it with services to sell you. So we must understand the transformation, how services is transforming, not in production, but within production and between consumption. So I would strongly urge that we carefully study this very carefully for Malaysia, how Malaysia can align itself, the development part and recalibrate that into the regulatory part and how we can manage this can manage the gap so that our SMEs and our domestic players can participate strongly in this. Particularly the SMEs, this open up huge opportunity for SMEs to participate. They, they don't have human capital, they don't have connectivity, and they need access to technology. So fairly, we need a very serious study for Malaysia. And that's where the CPTPP and ASEP complementarity actually comes together very nicely. All the framework has been set up. All Malaysia need to do is rectify and show that we are ready to play this game. Malaysia will go for the take up stage, I think. Thank you. Thank you, so Professor. If I could uh, just quickly add sure. one more point, if you allow me, I think uh, Prof really hit the nail there, spot on, absolutely right. And one more point I think uh, that negotiators may need to realize is the fact that we have spent the past uh, two, three decades talking about Mode 3, and Mode 3 really refers to how much foreign equity you would allow a foreigner to hold in a services sector if and when that foreigner comes to set up a services firm in Malaysia. And we argue whether it should be 30% or 49% or 51% or 70%. But within the services trade ecosystem, things have progressed. Now services suppliers want to be able to sell services from anywhere in the world. They don't have to physically locate themselves in Malaysia or in anywhere in the region to be able to sell services. So the nature of those transactions are increasingly becoming digitalized and negotiators need to keep up. So that's a reminder for myself and I think for my meeting colleagues who are also tuning in, but this is an important distinction for us to make. It's no longer the conventional way of no negotiating more services. More two, more one maybe? <laughs> yeah, exactly, mode one and mode two. So I think we also need to keep up on that front. Thank you, Zupri. Thank you. Uh, so again, uh, we welcomed all of the uh, positive and negative notes for us to align together as how Professor has put it, yeah? Uh, because I've seen in the chat room, uh, there are lots of facts and figures that have been uh, been, been, been presented uh, while those are true. Perhaps, again, it's how that we actually aligned and have uh, the win-win situations and as well as the country keeps on moving forward. I cannot really uh, answer and approach to these questions. In fact, our apologies due to the short period of time, but we will definitely promise to keep all these questions and comments in our depository so that we will receive from this from time to time. Uh, but before uh, we end the sessions uh, to respect each and everyone's time, um, uh, I would also like to invite uh, Ari, Professor and, and Tan Sui, just uh, one or two minutes uh, concluding remarks uh, or your last um, uh, presentation, last speech, <laughs> for instance, uh, last few words before we end the session today. I'll start with Ari. I'll move to 
uh, Professor Chandra, and then I'll move to Tansi Rebecca. Ari. Okay, thank you, Zokri. Once again, thank you to Ideas for this opportunity. I think uh, the key takeaway message that I would like to leave everyone with is this. Whether it's the CPTPP or the RCEP or any other FTA, on the one hand, we have tangible, palpable economic benefits. If Malaysia ratifies the agreement today, Malaysian exports will be enjoying preferential tariff access to 10 and possibly growing number of countries. That's a tangible benefit. It's a factual statement. Now contrast that with the probability of the concerns that are being raised. Uh, the probabilities that are being raised are we may get sued. Of course, the agreement allows you the right to sue, but simply because an investor has the right to sue the government, he's not going to do it. And even if he does, let's look at the statistics. Let's look at the number of BITs, investment treaties that we have in place, and the fact that we have only been sued twice, and in both those instances, the findings were in our favor. Then they talk about the possibility of policy space being, pre being affected, the possibility of increases in prices and medicines, so the takeaway message is when you look at the tangible benefits versus what could possibly or probably happen, then it is quite clear the position, the stance that Malaysia should take with regards to CPTPP and RCEP. Because the tangible benefits, in my view, certainly outweigh the probability uh, and the fear of the unknown. So that's my takeaway message. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Professor. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ide Ideas, for inviting me. I uh, actually enjoyed the discussion. Quickly, uh, I've been doing trade and uh, regional integration for the last 25 years. Uh, Malaysia has a very special place uh, in, uh, in my heart and also in terms of how I see the structural transformation in the region itself. Let me give you an example. In the 80s and 90s, Malaysia was ranked very high in Asia and in East Asia as the upcoming country to actually push the trade frontier. Why? There's three reasons, human capital, connectivity, and institutional reform. They are the frontier in doing all these three things. I believe Malaysia is ready to do these three things again, human capital, institutional reform, and infrastructure and connectivity and technology. And Malaysia is the right place to actually do all these things. And we actually done this. It's not that we are looking at Vietnam and say, Vietnam is doing something different. No, we have already done all this. We need to do new things. We need to do new frontier. We need to be forward looking. That is the element that Malaysia needs now. Once you get that in their perception, the business perception and institutional perception, the forward looking dimension, Malaysia will be ready for take up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Sri. Thank you. I mean, this, this two have articulated the points very, very clearly. Um, it's, it's really at the end of the day, where do you see yourselves? Where does Malaysia see itself? How does it want to pivot? And answering those questions will really then help us to decide whether or not to ratify these two very important agreements. Yeah, thank you. That's a very short one, Tansi, but it's very future uh, looking kinds of, of statement. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Malaysia, we would like to thank our panelists, uh, Yang Berbahagia, Professor uh, Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Rebecca, Professor Chandra, uh, Puan Ari Vidya Arimutu for joining us in, in the discussion today. Uh, we believe that this some sort of discussion is pertinent and essential in, in, in educating the, the people out there on what's happening on the ground and how can we actually prepare ourselves uh, to brace for the future that will come to our lives very soon. And especially in terms of the pandemic, there must be a lot of readjustment that needs to be made. Uh, we also like to thank uh, our funder, um, Frederick Norman Foundation for sponsoring this, this event, as well as the ASEAN Prosperity Initiatives. There will be more talks and uh, podcast series that talks about the ASEAN Prosperity Initiatives in the future. Uh, I would like to also thank to all of our uh, listeners, uh, participants and guests. Uh, I, I think this is by far the, the largest uh, webinar ideas have managed so far for, for, for this year. Uh, we've got 104 at this moment. Previously, I think at three, uh, 30 minutes ago, we had 
120. So that's quite a really big number. It shows actually that the public is eager to know about the, the trade um, prospect in Malaysia and how actually Malaysia is going on for forward with, with trade uh, transaction. Uh, so uh, we, we thank all of our uh, supporting partners as well as our, our participants. Now, uh, as my colleague Ali Iskandar has posted uh, in the chat room, uh, we look forward for you to join our, our newsletters because there are lots of events and lots of announcements and press statements and infographics that we will share in terms of democratization process and economic liberalizations uh, of, of Malaysia because that's what we do. That's the bread and butter for ideas. So if you do want to know more uh, about uh, our inputs and our policy papers, please join our newsletter. Alternatively, that you can also join our Twitter, our LinkedIn, our Facebook, our Instagram, all sorts of social media uh, that will actually provide you with all of our information and policy papers. And I would like to draw a special attention um, that tomorrow, uh, Ideas will be uh, organizing a briefing on the BRI monitor, uh, the Belt and Wood Initiative Monitoring, which is actually an initiative to look at the impact of, of Chinese in investment uh, to government's transparency and local governance. Now, interestingly, uh, the briefing tomorrow uh, is part of the process that we are doing with uh, four other regional research centers one in Myanmar, Papua New Guinea, uh, the Philippines, as well as in Cambodia, to look into the uh, China's uh, investment uh, into this country and how does actually this investment uh, relate or affect to government's transparency and good governance. So it's still at the same time, 10 to 12. If you're free, please join. Um, uh, as well as at the end of the month, we are also planning uh, to have a roundtable discussion on CPTPP. Uh, with, with some of the relevant sectors, uh, some of the relevant stakeholders and industry players in our country. Uh, so uh, bearing these two events that are coming up um, at the end of the month, as well as the month of September, we look forward for all of your support and your participation. Do reach out to us if you want to join. We'll definitely um, reply and address all of your queries um, for, for the matter of CPTP, BRI, as well as for our SAP. Again, once again, on behalf of the Board of Management, my colleagues would like to thank uh, Tansri, Professor, and Pan Ari uh, for the good discussion tonight, as well as to all our uh, participants and guests out there. So we wish you a very pleasant day ahead. Uh, thank you for joining, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye, and stay safe. Thank you. Stay positive.